Do you ask yourself whether it's worth the effort learning RxJS? At the end of this video you should be able to tell whether RxJS will make it to your tool belt. So let's directly dive in. Let's start with looking at which problems RxJS actually solves for us. On their homepage they say that RxJS is a library for reactive programming using observables to make it easier to compose asynchronous or callback based code. So RxJS is all about asynchronous programming and it claims to make it easier to compose this asynchronous code. Let's have a look at some characteristics of the RxJS library. First, RxJS is written in TypeScript. This means that the typings are always in sync with the implementation. The API is very nicely typed and so we have a good development experience if we use TypeScript. RxJS is framework agnostic. This means you can use it without any other library. So you can include it in any JavaScript project you want. On top of this, RxJS is isomorphic. So you can use it in the browser as well as on the server. RxJS is very popular. It has about 40 million downloads per week and 28,000 GitHub stars. RxJS is a quite mighty library and in total we have about 18 kilobytes of bundle size, minified and gzipped. But of course we should use the ECMAScript exports which RxJS provides for the operators, observables, subjects and so on. And with this we can reduce the bundle size even more. Okay, that said, let's have a look at some code. In this example we want to look up some books from the Gutenberg. Here we have an autocomplete function which takes an input field and turns it into an autocomplete. So briefly, we listen for input events from the input field, we wait until the user stops typing for 200 milliseconds, now we take the input field value and only continue if the value has changed. Then we build our request parameters and send the request to the server. By using switch map, we always only have one ongoing request. If there is an ongoing request, it is cancelled and we send a new request to the server with the new search term. Then we read out the JSON response and get the results from the response. Now we can use this autocomplete function and subscribe to the observable. Every time we get a new result, we update our DOM to reflect the book titles that match the search term. This is how using RxJS can look like. If you want to have a closer look at this example, you can visit my blog post, link in the description below. Of course we only scratched the surface of RxJS with this example. There is a large list of operators in the documentation that you can use to simplify your composition of asynchronous programming. We also should have a look at the drawbacks of the library to make a good decision. Every library you use adds up to your bundle size. Depending on your application, it can have more or less impact. Then we have a huge learning curve to master our XJS. We not only have a lot of operators, there are also some other concepts baked into this library. To name some, there are subjects and marble testing. Another potential drawback is that it's easy to overuse RxJS. RxJS is not a silver bullet. For example, there is the ECMAScript Promise API, which is more suitable for some situations. Also, you should not use it for synchronous operations. You should not use it to manipulate arrays, for example. Finally, there are the long stack traces. There is a lot of stuff going on in RxJS, 
and sometimes it can be quite hard to debug the code. Some dev tools allow you to blacklist libraries from your stack traces. This is quite handy if you use RxJS. Now let's try to answer the question whether you should use RxJS. The clear answer to this is like always, it depends. There are two main questions that you should ask yourself. First, are you building an app or a website? If you are building an app, the total bundle size doesn't matter as much as if you are building a static website. In general, the bundle size of an app is larger than that of a static website. So the relative cost of using RxJS is not that large if you are building an app. If you are building a mostly static website, it doesn't make sense to have RxJS in place. The second question is, are you and your team willing to invest the time learning RxJS? As I already said, RxJS is very complex and has a huge learning curve. Personally, I don't want to miss RxJS. It helped me solving a lot of problems and since I'm mainly building apps, it totally makes sense for me to use it. So now you should be well equipped to decide whether our XJS will make it to your tool build or not. If you learned something new in this video or simply enjoyed the content, please leave me a like. And remember, as an awesome developer, never stop learning. In this sense, see you in the next video.